In this lesson, I'm going to discuss baking from ZBrush uh, for rendering in Maya, which essentially just means getting all the information from your really highly detailed ZBrush sculpts and then actually rendering that in Maya so that you can see it in your final shots. So first I'm just going to load the model that we made in the previous lesson. So I can click to drag it out. I'll hold down shift so that it snaps. I'll push T to go into edit mode. Um, and I'm just going to tap this Y rotate, uh, turn on the floor and perspective is already on. So there we go. So this model, if I tap D on the keyboard, I can go up to the higher subdivision levels. And this one has quite a few subdivision levels. So what we want to do is take this model and all of its subdivision levels and create something called a displacement map so that Maya can have all the same detail and information in it by using this displacement map we create. And what a displacement map essentially does is it's just a texture that is used on the surface, but it's a texture that actually pushes vertices in and out of the surface to give you a lot more detail. So it's a texture that actually changes the shape of the surface. It's kind of like a bump map, but it actually moves verts and, and, and uh, combined with tessellation, it can actually uh, add more verts depending on how much is needed from the displacement map and things like that. So it's actually a very powerful method. Um, it's nice too because it generally only happens at render time. So your scene in Maya can end up being pretty light because your scene in Maya can have the really simple version of the object and then when it renders you'll get the more complicated version of the object like this. So creating this map in ZBrush is actually very straightforward. Um, except that the UI for it's a little bit strange, so some people get a little bit hung up on it. Um, if we go into the displacement map settings here, we can change the options and actually export displacement map. But even before we do that, I'm just going to go slightly up to the UV map here. Um, I'm going to note that we have proper UVs on our object. If I go to uh, more UVs, we can see them. I'm just going to go down to our lowest level here since it's the one that really matters. Um, in this case, we're going to bring a uh, level like this into Maya. You can also uh, bring slightly higher levels into Maya. Often I will prefer to bring slightly higher levels for more important objects. You get slightly better results if you bring something that's a little bit higher already into Maya. Like even now, that's only a thousand. Uh, it's only a thousand verts, so it's really not that bad. Um, and if I go back, you know, that's like, it says 276 verts. That's very little. Um, this will work. I'm going to try this, this level here, and I think it'll be okay. Um, but yeah, some, sometimes if something's really important, you might actually opt to bring um, more detail, uh, potentially quite a bit more detail, actually into Maya. Because the displacement map will, this is the quality of how well that displacement map works is someone based on just how much work you're trying to get it to do. And if you're bringing in something really low poly and trying to get the displacement map to do too much of the shaping for you, um, it's not really going to be able to shape as well as if you brought in something that was higher poly, um, in which the displacement map didn't need to do quite as much work. So here's my lowest level, and if I go to Morph UVs, then we'll see I have the UV mapping, of course. In Maya, I think it looks approximately like this. Yeah, I think it looks approximately like that in Maya. Uh, don't worry too much about the fact that in ZBrush it looks wrong. Um, we have ways of fixing that. Uh, just the fact that they're there, I can tell they're there and they're working, and that's fine. Um, also, I'm going to change my map size to 4096 which will just bake out a higher map size. Um, even if I wanted to ultimately use a map of a lower size, I could still bake out this one and then create the lower size maps from it. Um, very often, even if I'm going to use lower res things later, I, I prefer to work with everything sort of as high detail as I can. Um, you know, whatever's reasonable, not taking up too much space on the hard disk and all that stuff. Um, but I will attempt to make things higher details so that later on uh, it's if I ever need more detail it's easy to get that um, and then even if I'm gonna if I'm gonna use it low it's fine because it's so easy to down res stuff and it's so easy to use lower res textures just resize them down but you can't really go the other way you can't take things that you did it to low quality and bring them up in quality so easily so I'll usually prefer to work sort of at a quality level that's higher than I need 
um, and then everything, you know, once it's somewhat, um, you know, sampled down and all that, and it's not as detailed, um, it still stands up really well, and you know, this is what I need, but then if I need the more detailed stuff, I can do that. So, in this Displacement Map section, here's where I'm going to actually make the map, uh, which is going to use the UVs and the map size from this UV map section. So in the Displacement Map section, um, I need to change a bunch of these options, and the really troublesome one here is Mid, and you're going to see it's grayed out and I can't actually change it. So I'm going to change every other option that I want. I'm going to turn on Smooth UV, Flip V, 3 channels, 32-bit, not going to turn on adaptive, but this DPIC sub, I'm going to turn that to 3. So essentially this, uh, this DP sub picks is somewhat just the quality of the displacement map. It's for the sampling of it. Um, and it can sample it at higher quality if we turn this up. Uh, in my experience, 3 tends to be good enough. Uh, you, you could go to 4, it would be fine. Uh, it might just be slightly slower to make the map. Um, I don't really notice a difference in quality usually from 3 to 4, so 3 is fine. Um, smooth UV, that means that this model here, when it's actually uh, divided to create the displacement map, is going to actually smooth out the UVs, and it's important that that matches your settings in Maya. So the other option, of course, is that if you want to not smooth UVs, then you would have to, in Maya, make sure that when you round this object out, um, you also are not smoothing UVs. But by default, I'm going to use uh, V-Ray and Maya, and by default, uh, it's going to smooth UVs. So I want to make sure that I'm matching what Maya is going to do. Uh, flip V, remember how I was discussing with the UV map that it was kind of like upside down and not in the right correct, not sort of in the in the right um, layout for Maya compared to ZBrush. They they look different. That's because for some reason ZBrush has its UVs um, sort of inverted. Yeah, essentially they're flipped in the V direction. Uh, and I want to make sure that I'm matching the way that Maya expects my maps to look and expects the UVs to work. So flip V will just make sure that ZBrush takes into account the fact that it's strange compared to every other program out there. So flip V will essentially make a map that matches with Maya or that matches with almost any other program actually. ZBrush is one of the only ones that actually has UVs of its type. There's three channels here. Um, this allows us to create additional channels for information for the, uh, the color in the picture. Um, Ultimately, you can make something more efficient. However, uh, I've noticed certain bugs in turning this off. So even if ultimately I'm going to make a map that's just a grayscale map or something like that, I will often make it three channels at first, and then I will just edit the picture to fix that because I've had problems actually baking a map with a single channel out of ZBrush. So you could try uh, turning this off um, and baking a map, but I'm going to leave it on, and if I need the image to be more efficient because there's you know some wasted information in the other channels um, I will just you know fix that up in Photoshop myself afterwards or something um, just because I've noticed ZBrush, ZBrush sometimes has some strange bugs working with this so that's why I don't turn it off otherwise turning it off would basically make it more efficient but I'm gonna turn it on just to avoid some of those potential problems that I've noticed ZBrush has sometimes um, who knows maybe that's fixed by this version but I'm just gonna be safe here so in this alpha box here, you're going to notice that it's blank by default, and that actually is what we want, but we can't change this mid slider here, and that's what we really want to change this mid slider, and I can't change it because of this setting here in the alpha box. So if I click in here, and I go to alpha, and I just choose any alpha, so now I've just applied any alpha shape, now suddenly you're going to see I am able to change the slider. I don't know why you can't just change it by default, it's just a massive ZBrush UI stupidity. Um, but I'm going to go in here, I'm going to type 0, there we go, and what that means is that perfect black in the displacement map means no displacement, and I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say alpha off, just back on the alpha picture, turn it right off again, and you can see mid is still changed, so you have to turn alpha on just so that you can change mid, and then you can turn it back off, and you can leave it, and it'll be just fine. So what this is going to create in terms of an image is it's going to make an image that's black where we don't need to push the surface at all. 
uh, it's going to be white or various levels of uh, positive gray color uh, where it needs to push the surface outwards. And then for areas where it needs to push the surface inwards, it's actually going to store negative color values, which are very strange. And of course, you might think that that would be odd. And how would you even see that in Photoshop? Which is true. It can be difficult to work with those in Photoshop. Um, but they'll be actually precise numbers that represent the exact distances uh, from this surface here to the intended position in the displacement. Um, now, they're not going to be from precisely this surface. They're actually going to be from a Catmull Clark subdivision of this surface, which is great. That's what you want. That's going to it's going to come from a really smooth version of this. The reason that's so good, of course, is because in Maya you're going to smooth the object out. So in Maya you will be using the displacement map on something that's smoothed as well. So we're just going to do that automatically for you. And a lot of other methods of doing this you have to do it yourself. But in this method it's going to do it automatically, so that's fine. Um, so I'm going to go in. I'll say. Uh, Create and export map right here. So I'm going to call this rock displacement text, and I'm going to turn it to OpenEXR mode. So OpenEXR is essentially um, an extremely good image format. It's able to store a lot of information, it's able to store that information very accurately. If you bake displacement maps to things like a Targa image or something like that, it's not anywhere near accurate enough. Um, you know, you can use a 16-bit image, something like a 16-bit like a per channel PNG, which means it's ultimately a 64-bit image. You could use something like that and it would be okay. Uh, but really, if you have 32 bits per channel, such as in an OpenEXR, um, and you actually have, uh, the, if you have a, an OpenEXR image that is 32 bits per per channel means that in total, because you have red, green, blue, and alpha channels, you're taking 32 bits times four. You know, you have ultimately, you have a 128-bit image. Um, and in this case, we're just gonna use one of the channels, but OpenEXR images can uh, can contain a lot of information. Uh, they can even contain others, other kinds of channels, like they can contain, uh, you know, Z depth and other things like that. You could, OpenEXR is a very flexible images. Essentially, I'm just turning this to OpenEXR because it's going to give me the most accurate results. Um, and it's it's going to be in a useful linear color space where I don't have to worry about the numbers in the colors um, you know, being imprecise or inaccurate. Basically, the, the numbers for those colors are going to represent exact distances in Maya. So, you know, I could sample a color and look at its value and then know that that would be an actual sort of measurable number in Maya for how far the vertex would move. So, I'm going to save this picture right here. Save. And that, of course, is going to make ZBrush think a lot. Uh, it can take quite a long time to bake displacement maps. Um, at this point, I think I'll probably just you know, stop recording the video and then start it again so that you guys can see once it's done. You know, it might might take 10 minutes or so. It really depends on how complicated the object is and how fast the computer is. And again, I don't think this computer is very fast. So um, I will be back in a moment. Okay, so the computer has finished calculating the displacement map, and now it's asking me if I would like to export a matching mesh with the displacement map. I'm going to say yes. Um, and that's going to be the mesh that I'm actually going to use in Maya. And I'm basically going to replace whatever my existing model is in Maya with this mesh. So I'm going to say yes. Uh, and at that point, everything in ZBrush is finished. So now we can move over to Maya and continue. So in Maya, we have a completely blank, empty scene here. Um, we're just going to start this again. Remember that at this point, we've kind of decided that the real version of this model is the zero file, right? So I should be able to recreate this model in Maya anytime just from the things that I created in ZBrush. Uh, and generally, I think that's a good practice. Most of the, you know, you might have some Maya specific setup that you keep in a separate Maya file, but you know, if you ever wanted to go change that rock, you you try to avoid changing it with Maya uh, unless you, unless you were sure you had a very specific way to get your changes in Maya back into the ZBrush file, because you really do want your ZBrush file to represent the final state of the model. Uh, sometimes it can become very confusing when you make changes in Maya and you don't make those same changes in ZBrush and you start getting a couple models that are out of sync uh, and it's really important to make sure that your model actually syncs up. Um, so in this case I'll import it 
Um, and I'm going to be get essentially importing the file that was created from that displacement. So I'm going to go to import. So here's the rock displacement texture that I made. Um, and then you're going to see it also sort of automatically gave me a copy of the uh, lower subdivision level of the object um, that I was on when I made the displacement. So this is one I'm going to merge into the scene. I'm going to use this merge into selected namespace um, so that I don't get um, you know, funny prefixes on the objects. This is generally what I recommend using when importing. So I'm going to import. There's our object. We call this rock or rock geo or something like that. Um, now I can fix the normals on this object because, of course, they're completely screwed up. So I'm going to go to normals, unlock normals, and I'm going to go to normals, soften edge. There we go. Now, if I push three, on the keyboard, you're going to see that it smooths this object out. Um, and I actually want this object to render smoothly as well. Um, it's from that smooth shape that I'm going to displace the surface using the texture map. So we just want to set this up to render smooth. So for me to do that, um, I'm going to go into my render settings. Choose V-Ray. Uh, I'm going to just set a file name prefix, which is test. This is just sort of a garbage file. Um, I almost always render to EXRs. As I said before, they're such incredibly useful file format. Generally, they work great. Uh, I'm not going to bother changing the camera any of that yet because I, you know, again, this is just a test. This isn't an actual, you know, final shot or anything like that. Um, however, to get this subdivision working, so when you push 3, it actually renders it round in V-Ray, you have to go into the global options here and choose render viewport subdivision. There's other ways to set up a uh, subdivision on objects so that they round out. Uh, this is a very, very easy way to do it. Um, and what I generally do is I set this up as the default on most objects. Uh, and then if there's other objects that I need more intricate control over precisely how they subdivide, then I attach separate properties to those objects and control them with a bit more care. Um, this, but in a lot of situations, this works for most things. Um, when you turn this on, by default, your scene is going to become really, really heavy because V-Ray is going to make tons and tons of triangles for every smooth surface. Generally, it makes way too much detail, uh, a lot more than you need, and a lot more that you can really tell is even there. So what I'll often do is I'll often go to the settings, default displacement and subdivision, and I can turn this down to a much lower number, like 12. So the default is 256, which is unbelievably high, uh, and it slows down a lot of people's renders really, really badly. If I just turn this down to a, a smaller number like 12, uh, it means the computer won't try to cut up this object into quite as many super tiny polygons. Um, so if I needed more triangles on any individual objects, again, I could go back and attach other properties to those individual objects. But for now, this will be good enough. So with just those two things, I should actually be able to get a rounded out object. So now that I have the rendering set up, uh, I'm going to have to throw a light in here and get a material in here. So I'm just going to go to Create Lights, Directional Light. I'll just move this light a little, maybe rotate it a bit so that I can see the way it points at the object. Perfect. If I push 7, on my keyboard, I'll just get a rough approximation of how that light is working. Remember that it's never a very good example of what your V-Ray lighting is really going to look like. It's just a really simple preview when you push 7 like that. I can push 6 if I just want to go back to the default lighting in the viewport. Um, and then I need to put a V-Ray material actually on this object. So I'm going to click on this object, right click, assign new material. And in the window that pops up, I'm going to choose V-Ray material. We go. So I like to name the materials. I think it's really important to do this. So I'm going to say rock mat. There we go. Uh, I also like to name the shading group. If you want to get to the shading group, you can go uh, one up just by pushing uh, this arrow right here. 
We have now we're in the shading group of the rock mat. Um, and the two are generally used together as a pair. So this so the shading group now is called rock SG and the material is called rock mat. Um, that'll keep it easy to keep that'll make it easy to keep track of. So do a render and there we have it. We have a simple shape. If I actually want to see how this is going to render, I can go to view camera settings, resolution gate, and then I know precisely how I'm framing it in my final render, because I was a little bit too close to see the whole rock in the last render. So let's try this again. There we go. So we've got this rock, but it's missing all of the detail that we need. So if we want to get that much better detail in here, then we can apply that displacement map. So if I go back to this object, and if I go back to the material attributes, so here's that material. And remember, if I push this button here, it's just to the left of the show button. If I push this arrow, I'm going to go to the shading group that's connected to it. You're going to see it says displacement material right here. And this is where I can actually plug in the displacement map. So in here, I'm going to choose this checker box. I just click on it, and this is where you actually load up the map. So I'm going to click there to load up a new texture. And then in this create, create render node, window that appears. I'm going to choose file because I want to open up a file. And then we see the displacement node. We also see file up at the top. Um, I could push this tab or I could just push in the arrow right here and that'll take me to the tab. And that'll take me to the file that's ultimately driving this displacement. There we go. So right now there's no actual file opened up yet. I've just told Maya and V-Ray that it should be looking for a file. So now I can push the browse button here. And there's the displacement map that I made. So I can just open it up. Great. So now I've got that picture in here. The only problem is V-Ray and Maya, they need to know how to interpret this correctly. And right now I haven't given it any information regarding how to interpret it. So normally in V-Ray, it's really important that you flag textures um, so that it knows how you're intending to use this. And when you're using a displacement map, there's two options that you want to make sure you get right. Um, and we can add them. I can go to Attributes, V-Ray. There's Texture Input Gamma. So I turn that on. Attributes, V-Ray, Allow Negative Colors. Turn this on. And once I turn both these on, now if I scroll down to the bottom of the Attributes and I open Extra V-Ray Attributes, I will see that Allow Negative Colors is checked. This Enable Input Texture this enable input texture correction is checked. This color space here though is wrong. OpenEXR files are basically always in linear color space. And also, even if you weren't using an OpenEXR file, chances are you would intend to use the data in there as if it were linear, even if it wasn't. Now, if you don't understand too much about linear color space versus sRGB color space, whatnot at the moment, that's okay. Just remember that when you create displacement maps, uh, in almost all situations, you're going to want to go to the color space here, and you're going to want to set that to linear. Um, other maps are very often going to be used differently, but displacement maps, they'll pretty much always be linear. So I've got enable texture correction, just that's turned on, and I've got the color space set to linear, and I've got allow native colors. The reason I have allow negative colors is remember in that displacement map I made, some of the pixels there have negative colors that push the surface in. So V-Ray has to know that it's allowed to use those. Okay, now there's one other thing that's wrong. And Maya has stupidly hooked up its alpha channel uh, to control the final result that we get. And we actually don't want that. Um, in ZBrush, we hit export three channels. And we have the red, the green, and the blue channel. And they would actually, essentially, they're all the same. And they all have the right information in them. So what I want to do here is I just want to use one of those channels. So of course, the first one is red, so I may as well use it. So what I'm going to do in this file is I'm just going to hit select. That's going to select that file. Um, and now what I want to do is I actually want to see it. And I want to see the displacement node that it's hooked into. Um, Something as simple as a hypergraph can do that really well. I opened up this by just going window, you know, hypergraph connections. That'll bring up another one of these windows. This is really just about, these are really very similar here. Uh, this happens to be a hypergraph hierarchy window, but you can switch between the two just by clicking this here. 
so it's really easy to move back and forth. So in the attribute editor for the file node, I push the select button, and that actually selects the file node itself, um, which I want to change the connections of so that I can change the way that it's plugged into the displacement. So I hit select to select the file itself, and then in that hypergraph, I show the input output connections right here. There we go. And here's the displacement node, and here's the file node. Now what is wrong between them is that this arrow is connecting the alpha to the displacement. And I don't want to use the file's alpha, I want to use the file's red channel. So if I click on this arrow, I can just push delete. That'll eliminate that connection. But now of course it means that the file's not hooked up to the displacement at all. So I need to fix that. The easiest way to fix this is to hold down shift and middle mouse drag from one to the other. And when you middle mouse drag from one node to another in any of those editor windows uh, while you're holding down shift, you'll get this connection editor that'll pop up. And now I can choose out color, red. So that's the actual red color of the texture map. And I'm going to plug that into displacement. And that's very similar to what was being done before. It's just that now, instead of it being the alpha, now it's the out color red plugged into displacement. So that should actually be correct. So now I can try rendering. Yep, that looks like our ZBrush detail. In fact, it looks very accurate. Of course, you might wonder just how close this is matched up. So if I want to do a test, and this is a really good idea, because, you know, it, it might be kind of like the object, but there might be problems. It might not be as close as we would like. Um, if I want to check, one of the easiest things I can do is just export out something from ZBrush that actually has a lot of that detail in it or that's close. Now, I'm not going to be able to handle all the polygons from ZBrush, but in Maya, just as a reference surface, I am going to be able to bring in uh, a fair amount from ZBrush. So in order to bring in this reference, I will just go back to ZBrush. Go to a higher subdivision level. I'm going to go fairly high, but I'm not going to go to the absolute highest one. Here, let's try 1.122 million. That'll be good. So now in ZBrush, I want to make a version of this that matches fairly well with the final shape, but that I can also bring into Maya because it's not so high poly that it won't even open in Maya in a reasonable amount of time. So what I want to do is I want to get this final version. I want to decimate it so that it's a fairly high poly count, but not so insanely high that I can't deal with it. So if I push Shift D, of course, I can go down to lower subdivision levels on this retopo surface here. Remember, this is the main one, the one that I've got that really has the good topology, and this is the one that I sent to uh, Maya by baking the displacement and everything. So every time I push D on it, I'm going to go on it up a level, and I'm going to get it around a million polys. There we go. There is one level higher, but I've decided I'm not actually going to use that one, um, because that's just sort of too much for Maya, uh, and it'll just take a while to decimate. So this will be good enough to see if I'm close, because the difference between this and the next level up is extremely minimal. So I'm going to push this solo button here, so that I can only see one at a time. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a reference of this retopo object, so I'm just going to duplicate it. There we go. Uh, I don't need my old decimated one anymore, so I can click on it, and I can choose delete. Uh, and now this will be my new decimated model. So I'll say rename decimated. Great. Um, so to decimate this, Z plugin, decimation master, preprocess current. So we'll think about that. So analyzing the mesh, trying to think about how it can decimate that. Um, sometimes, of course, this preprocessing takes a while. Uh, this one's a little bit lower poly than uh, the last one that I decimated. Um, so hopefully this won't be too terrible.
Yeah, not too bad. That only took about 10 seconds or something. So uh, now I can go back to the Z plugin, and now that I've pre-processed it, now I can actually decimate it. So I can decide how many polygons I'm willing to use in Maya. Um, and let's say 600,000. You know, that's still pretty high. Um, let's try that. So decimate current. And I can't even really tell the difference between this and the other model if I just look at it and I'm zoomed out. If I look at it zoomed in closely, I mean, now I can start to see the difference. You know, it's pretty subtle. If I go between the two, right, very, very similar objects. Um, so this decimated one here should be a fine example for Maya. So I can just export this. Save a temporary file that I don't care about. Go back into Maya. So I've just selected this rock. I'm making a new layer, just by hitting create layer here, and I'm gonna say rock lay to make a new rock layer. So now I can easily toggle that rock on and off. There we go. Now I'm gonna bring in that other reference object. So file, import, gonna find that delete me file that I just saved, you know, which is a garbage temporary file. I'm just using it to quickly get a reference into Maya. So open up that. There we go. And you can see like we have a lot of the information from ZBrush there. It's pretty good. Um, if I want to get uh, better normals out of it, I can go to normals, unlock, and then I go to normal soften edge. Now this will take a while because of course this model is so high poly that everything Maya does on this model is super slow. But hopefully it'll be reasonable. Looks like it's not that bad. It's kind of like just low enough that Maya's not crawling as bad as you might normally expect it to. But Maya doesn't like these super high poly objects usually. Um, Maya's performance compared to a lot of other software out there is pretty poor when it comes to high poly objects. Okay, so I'm going to make a new layer for it. This is going to be called ref lay. And I'm going to throw a new material in here. So I'll just grab another V-Ray material. I'll make this one some really obvious color, like red or something. So it's going to be really obvious where that one is showing and where the new one is showing. Okay, so I can see them both, so I'm going to hit render here. Okay, so there are ever so slight imperfections where the computer can't tell exactly um, you know, which one to show. If I move one of these models you know, forward or back, um, hopefully it'll take over quite a bit. Um, you know, if it doesn't, that would potentially be a problem. Uh, one of the easiest ways I can test this is I can just take my low geo, um, and I'm going to undo this in a minute, but I can just use something like edit mesh transform components just to expand this entire model out a tiny bit. So for local translate, I could uh, change this number here. And you're going to see if I do change that number, the object just kind of inflates or deflates here. So I'm just going to turn it up a little bit. So here, let's say 0 0.5. There we go. And now that it's at 0 0.5, of course, that's going to make the surface a little bit bigger. So let's see if it always renders in front of that other red surface, or if we still see a lot of that red surface poking through. We see basically none of that red surface poking through. I mean, even if there's a tiny bit, it would be so negligible it wouldn't matter. Um, and of course, that was a very small change. That's 0 0.05, you know, let's try 0 0.1. That's an incredibly small change. I would expect to still see a little bit of the red surface punching through, um, but we'll see.
you know, how close does that let us get? Okay, so even at a difference only of 0 0.1, uh, the only place we can see that red reference surface at all is right here. So that means it's an awfully close match. Now I can try, of course, the opposite. So here's negative 0 0.5. That's going to push the object in, meaning that our reference surface now should be on top. So our reference surface should be visible almost everywhere, and this version should not show up very much. Let's take a look. Excellent. So even just pushed in a tiny little bit, the reference surface is showing up everywhere. Let's try an, an even more accurate amount, 0 0.1, you know, really small amount for an object that's this big. Yeah, there's some tiny little spots that don't match up. Uh, you know, keep in mind that that amount that isn't matching up is so unbelievably tiny. Like, the difference between those surfaces uh, is so small. Um, you know, it's just that the, the V-Ray render is quite accurate. And it's going to catch whichever one is closest to the camera. But, I mean, it's bare. Like, this part is just barely closer than this. Um, you know, the, the difference is, you know, within this kind of a tolerance. So it's very, very low. Uh, we know it's less than uh, 0 0.5. Uh, it's probably even less than that. I mean, there's these are the worst places, and most of the best places are fine. And even these places, the chance that we're ever going to be able to tell in Maya that that's not exactly where it was in ZBrush um, is really low. It's, it's not like the audience who's going to watch your animation knows where your surface is precisely in ZBrush. So as long as it looks good in Maya, generally that's fine. Uh, and you generally, most of the time, you don't need that level of accuracy. If you did want a lot more accuracy, what you would do is you would just have to send out a model from ZBrush that was a lot higher poly as your base mesh in Maya. So instead of our rock model in Maya being, you know, 300 polygons like it is now, um, you know, it would be have a much higher poly object in Maya. So I could just undo a bunch here if I want to get rid of that completely. Uh, I could also just change my local translate to zero, and that'd be the same as just undoing it completely, but I'm just going to undo a bunch until it's gone. There we go. So now I know it matches up very, very, very well with my ZBrush model. Last thing that I'm going to show here is how to fix the texture that you've made to be more efficient and smaller, because right now, it's a gigantic EXR file, and it's actually using all the information of three channels. Even though this displacement map only needs to use the red channel, there actually is a green channel and a blue channel in there, and they're useless. Uh, and although ZBrush, in theory, can create a map that's one channel instead of three channels, uh, it's buggy, and if you use that map, it actually ends up giving you different displacement, and it doesn't end up being as accurate as this. Uh, so what we have here is actually correct, and we just need to edit that picture to get rid of the other ones. So in Photoshop, I can open this image, the displacement map that we already made, which is an EXR file. Um, it's 36 megabytes, which is you know kind of big, uh, only because we really don't need nearly all that much information in it. Once I choose to open it, we'll see this window that appears um, where we can use it as transparency or as ch alpha channel. And remember that Photoshop tends to treat the transparency in a very broken way. Uh, compared to most other uh, proper 3D software and proper compositing uh, programs and things like that. So the Photoshop transparency is very, very strange. You want to work with proper alpha channels whenever possible, um, you know, unless it's just for painting in Photoshop. But when you're trying to do anything that works with other software, you have to be very careful about the transparency um, and make sure you're using proper alpha channels instead. Uh, it's the main reason, for example, that we can't use PNG uh, we can't use PNG alpha channels for most things because Photoshop treats PNG alpha as transparency and there's no real way around that. Um, whereas, uh, in theory, the PNG files should be able to hold alpha just as well as target files, um, you know, in practice because we're using Photoshop, uh, they don't really end up doing so. Uh, so it ends up being a really similar thing with opening XR files. Um, Photoshop's not going to handle the transparency properly. It's going to handle, it's going to 
give us lots of problems if we use it as transparency. But if we treat it as an alpha channel, which is of course what we want, um, then it'll work correctly. So just make sure when you're working with things in Photoshop, you're generally using alpha channels whenever possible instead of Photoshop's native transparency. So, and she's okay. And here's the map that was created. This map's the one that was created directly from ZBrush. And if I, well, the layers, I've just got this background one. And if I go to the channels, you see that I have the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel. They're all exactly the same. Um, the RGB just you know, looks the same. Uh, but this picture and this picture, they're basically wasteful and they're just redundant because the other image already has them. Just or the red channel, I guess I should say, already has them. So if I just go to the green and the blue, I can just fill them in with, with uh, pitch black. So if I push D, the just the letter D in Photoshop, I'll go to the default colors. You can push X and D and just make sure that you're getting the default colors there. Um, because if anything else is selected, say red or something, um, then you might see a different color in there. And this is just a really, really quick way to get black and white. So I push D on the keyboard. I get the black color there. And then I'm going to go to the green channel. I'm going to push Control A to select everything. That'll select the whole channel. And I'll hold down Alt and I'll push Backspace. And holding down Alt and Backspace is one of the most useful things in Photoshop. It's going to fill your selection with that color. There you go. So that's good. And then I'm going to go to the blue channel. Same thing. I'm going to hold down Alt. I'm going to push Backspace. So now my blue and my green channels are empty and my red channel has all the data. I remember red is the only channel I was actually using in Maya with the displacement map. And if I go back to the RGB channels, uh, or just go back to the RGB display which shows you the combined channels of everything, see it just looks really bright red. Um, and it's not like white because we don't have any green or blue in it. So normally the green and blue would mix in here and they'd make it look white. But of course, since uh, only red has information in it now. Now we get a really red looking displacement map. That's completely fine. In fact, in this case, it's exactly what we want. Um, because the other channels are even simpler now, uh, this should just save into a really small, uh, more efficient file. So now I'll just go to save. There we go. And I can save right over the old one because I haven't made any destructive changes. We have all the information that I still want. Uh, you might want to back up your original file first if you're not 100% sure that you did this properly. Uh, I'm fairly confident that I did this well, so I'm just gonna save. You know, worst case scenario, if you really did break this, you could just bake it out of ZBrush again, so it's not that big of problems. Uh, I'm just gonna hit save. Yes, I want to replace the old one. There we go. And now I can go back into Maya. Um, oh, I should mention that uh, it'll pop up a window here. So when I save the file, going to pop up this window and this asks me what kind of compression that I want to use. Um, this wavelet compression here is totally lossless and is essentially uh, you know the best type or at least the, the type that's most likely to work the best in most situations. So yeah choose wavelet um, generally uh, it'll be good most of the time and then I'm going to hit OK and that's going to save a very accurate uh, lossless file with all the information here but it's going to compress it as much as it can compress it without losing any of the information that we want. Great so now that that is saved we can just switch back to Maya. So back in our Maya scene, uh, I could hit reload here, although V-Ray generally will automatically check for any textures to see if they've been reloaded. But I can just hit that just to be sure, and I can render my scene again. So here's the V-Ray window, and you're going to see it looks exactly the same as it did before even though it's got a map that's much more efficient now. So my map used to be, I think, about 36 megabytes, uh, and now it's about 9, 9.5 megabytes. So in a lot of situations, uh, this is going to be worth it just to save you a bunch of space. Uh, those OpenEXR files, of course, they can get really heavy on disk, depending on just how detailed they are and all that. So if you can uh, if you can save a bit of space, it can be useful. Another thing that you could potentially do if you want to be really clever and if you really want to max out sort of Maya's internal um, usage of RAM and you know get that as efficient as you can be, is you could actually stick different objects into different channels of the same displacement map, and you could use Photoshop just to copy and paste the data between there. Um, 
because Maya might actually treat that a little bit more efficiently, um, at least internally. It might help Maya not have to store those other channels at all. So, you know, if you wanted to, if, you, if you're really worried about efficiency, you could do that. But if you have quite a bit of RAM on your computer, it's probably not a big issue. Uh, most of the time, I think it would be okay just to do this. And as long as you had, you know, plenty of RAM on your machine, you should be fine. Uh, generally, when you're rendering with V-Ray and using ZBrush like crazy on things like we're doing here, um, you know, you, you usually are using a machine that's uh, fairly powerful. So if you aren't, you meant to do some things to be a little bit more effective with your space. Uh, similarly, if you're working in an engine or something, then you're gonna have to use a dramatically different method of doing this because in a game engine, what we're doing in V-Ray is not gonna run real time. Um, but we'll actually take a look at that in the next lesson. Uh, and I'll talk about baking maps that will work real time. And we can actually use displacement in real time nowadays with, uh, with tessellation and a lot of the modern, modern game engines, they support that well. Um, and we'll also look into baking normal maps and AO and all that sort of stuff. This should show you the workflow for displacement um, in V-Ray. And if you know what you're trying to do is render off your models uh, in V-Ray with the best possible quality and you know retaining all that shape from ZBrush, then this method should suffice.